you said reminded me of uh the eat the rich documentary on uh netflix i, don't know I just watched that the other night yep i watched it the other night of like the people that are on tv saying sell are then getting blamed for market manipulation by the people who are not taking their advice for doing what they're doing what were your thoughts on that i mean obviously you and me probably intimately follow that gamestop saga uh when you saw that documentary was there any emotions that you felt seeing it all happen again <laughs> yeah, I wish I got in earlier and stayed in longer. That's what I felt. <laughs> um, yeah, no, did you I mean, play GameStop. Did you do a trade on it when it was going on? Um, I did do GameStop and AMC, but but like this, you, I think you know my personality at this point. Um, after I saw some pretty good gains, I was out, moved on to the next thing I wanted to focus on. Um, I wasn't trying to chase that thing all the way. Um, it's just not my style to do that. Um, there was a guy who put in 500 K and you look at his Robin hood at the end and it's $5 literally. Do you remember that part? Like, I, yeah, that was insane. Um, it, it, well, it's just like, again, I get that people just want to gamble. And that was sort of the theme in the beginning was like, they were just gambling. But even when you go to a casino, don't you want to end up leaving with some money? I think that's the part that I just can't get here is like, Come on. I, I I thought what was really interesting about it was talking when they had the professional investors talking about the fact that like, look, the reality is this, but everyone else is saying no that. And as someone who sort of is like, <laughs> you know, sees both sides, I was just thinking to myself, like, so many retail investors just want to follow a trend because it seems like it can't ever stop. But the most important thing, okay, I'm going to, let's take a big step back. So I used to sit down with some, some folks I know who wanted to get into investing and trading. And we often would talk about explaining how to look at charts, how to read breaks, how to understand when the collapse was coming on different things. And um, I, I would show this whiteboard where I would show like 10 people in the room, right? <laughs> I want to buy this for a dollar. Well, now that you like it, I like it for dollar twenty-five. I want it for a buck fifty. I want it for two, all the way. And we just kept going and going and going and going and going until it hit like a hundred. And I was like, the minute I'm at a hundred, I'm like, okay, I'm out. And no one else has any money left to buy. So the next person in line who can afford to buy it is like, well, I guess the best I can do is eighty. So now instead of going up ten cents at a time, it drops twenty bucks. So everyone else who has it is like, holy shit, I'm gonna lose all my money. I'm out. I'll take 60. I'll take 60. So I still get 60 bucks. Then it's 40. Then it's 20. Then it's zero. And this is how bubbles burst, whether it's it's any asset class at all. This is the classic case of a bubble, right? Now, what makes this so difficult is we're talking about, we, we're talking about like margin. We're talking about like um, cycles within it. So the algos start to think that things are going up. Then the funds want to jump in to grab their 10% of, of flesh. And then everyone who's late is now trying to jump in. So it just becomes this like upward spiral of never ending profit until the last person pays the last highest price because it always, always will happen. And then it just starts to go down fast. And now some companies can do really well and, and figure out a way to make that work. And some can't, I, you know, to each their own. But I think the lesson of that documentary was really like, I mean, they didn't say this in the documentary, but for me, the lesson of the documentary was have an exit plan and set it, right? Whether that's trailing stops or knowing when to take your profit or taking some money off the table even, right? Take your initial investment out maybe. Um, and I know anyone who hears this is going to say, well, it's not diamond hands and blah, blah, blah. It's like, listen, I've held stocks for 20 plus years. I get it. But they're good quality companies that are going to be around for a very long time it's not the same thing as like i mean i'm at to your point going from what was that fifty thousand to five million or whatever i forget five hundred thousand to five dollars yep to, to think about that that was life-changing when even the gentleman at the end who had the family who, yep. who ended up doing okay but still lost most of it it's like you know you 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 had a trajectory to change the entire way your family would live forever but you had to get another $2. Yeah. And that $2 cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I think it's important to understand that like you can be greedy and still put a stop loss or, or, or a stop gap behind you to make sure you don't lose everything. Right. And if you slide backwards and you get called, you have a ton of profit. And if it keeps going up, jump back in again and set another stop behind it. Right. Like yeah. there's so many things th that make manipulation impossible to happen. But yet what do we hear? It's fixed.
It's hundred percent fixed. And I would challenge this. The same folks who say things are fixed. I would ask them, sure. Explain to me the operational back end of a market and tell me how it works. How does clearing work? How does a market maker work? And tell me, I mean, fill me in on the details that you understand about the system you're calling manipulation. Uh, because you well, their, their argument was Ken Griffin talked to Vlad and got the job done. And it's like, okay. That part is not what I'm talking about because I don't use Robin Hood, but I still could buy and sell that. No problem. Those yeah. were just specifically Robin Hood traders. And they, let me be honest with you. They should be suing Robin Hood. I don't know why they didn't. In fact, I was tweeting like crazy, calling him and the company out, fire this guy. He should be let go immediately. This is fraud. Um, but people just, you know, nobody cared. Yeah. I know we're way, we're way off the topic of the original here, but, um, I, I, do you think in the next bull run NFT and cryptos also just goes this nonsense that it did in 2021 or is the next bull run going to be more tame? Cause at least a generation of retail investors will have felt the pain of 2022, probably until 2024. <clears throat> That's such a great question. Like, like, like you're a better investor cause you went through 2008 and I'm assuming 2008 wasn't the best for you. Cause you weren't as good of an investor as you are now, even though you probably have some opportunities. Go back further, man. Oh, one. Oh, one. In oh, one. I know so many people who were paper millionaires. Um, I was an adult in 01, right? I had, I started trading in, um, oh my gosh, what year? 2000 ish, give or take 2000, early 2001. Um, so I witnessed it live firsthand money in the market. Right. And let me tell you something. Um, I was investing in mortgage backed securities because everybody was investing in mortgage backed securities. Now through an act of God, I had gotten out of them because they were starting to cut their yields um, at that time. So I, I pure luck, no, no genius, all luck. Um, but I watched it happen in 01. Then I watched it happen in 07 and 08. And in 01, I was too, too young, too inexperienced to, to really understand how to properly capitalize on what happened after. Yeah. But I, I, I learned. In 07, 08, when I saw the signs, I started preparing. Yeah. I started putting cash away. I started making sure I knew what I wanted to do afterwards. So when the S hit the fan, um, I was, I'm a, I'm a natural risk taker, although it probably doesn't sound that way when you hear me talk, which is why I talk about stop losses and puts, mm -hmm. because I'm willing to go all out on the asymmetrical win, but I'm not going to lose all my money just to do it. Mm -hmm. um, when 08 happened, um, I was working in the debt space, um, doing a lot of mezzanine bridge and commercial debt. And you saw it happening. Brokers were suddenly going out of business. They suddenly couldn't offer you rates. They weren't able to give you quotes on, on lending. Um, and I remember watching it all happen live, what was going to happen, but you know, yada, yada, yada. The beauty of going through in 01, recognizing the signs in, in 07, <coughs> early, late 07, early 08, was I started selling everything and moving to cash so that when the time was right, I jumped in and started buying real estate. Um, no, I do not time it perfectly, but the reality is in hindsight, it looks pretty perfect, but it's just because it's gone up so much. So although right now we're feeling the pain of how low things are in the scheme of things, we're not even close to low. Yeah. We're just low in, in relative comparison to where we were a little while ago. Um, I think that for everyone who's going through this right now, there should be and the first and biggest lesson a retail investor in the equity space needs to be aware of is this is why you don't use margin if you don't understand the risk and how to protect it. That's number one. I think number two, if you are looking to spend big money on things like a house, like a car, like anything that's going to take significant cost, just ask yourself a what if question. What if I lose my job? What's the worst case scenario? What if I can't get hired for six months? What if I have to pay a 7% interest rate. And I know it's hard to say that in hindsight. I totally, totally understand that that is hard to say in hindsight. But if you can get halfway there and take the lessons you're learning from it, you're going to be very successful. Like I think if any lesson should be learned here, it's that you can't hear what Powell's saying and not take action on it. Or just don't check your portfolio. That's okay as well, by the way. Like if you're just throwing your, your extra money from your paychecks to acquire positions, I think that's, you're you're a genius. You're going to probably be a millionaire, but you can't check your portfolio every eight minutes, give yourself anxiety and convince yourself you need to get out of positions. It's very, very different if you're investing in, I'll just throw like some of the popular ones we hear like QQQ, VTI, v, VTSAX, whatever, right? Like if you're in index funds or broad-based funds, 
you know, DCAing is the name of the game because it's a blended position. If you're in, you know how I feel about companies like Upstart. If you're an Upstart and this thing is down 95%, you lost 95% of your money. I mean, that sucks, but like you probably did. It's probably not going to ever get anywhere near that again. So the question then is, what is the, what can you do today moving forward? And take that as the cost of education that I will never let it happen again. And that's okay as well. And by the way, you'll be able to write that off for the next 10 years, right? At three grand a year, it's not the end of the world. That's going to help you out at tax time forever. Again, not a CPA, but you should definitely be thinking about that. Too many people. That, that psychology of, 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 of an expensive lesson, I feel like sometimes people are afraid of that, but that's just life, right? Life is an expensive lesson in a lot of different ways. <clears throat> it's Life is just an expensive lesson. I agree. You know, like when you don't get that promotion at work, you know, and it feels like, let me even... If, if 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 you spend your day thinking that like every time something bad happens in the world that it's the world is against you, usually it's not the whole world against you. The whole world's kind of indifferent. It's not the economy against you. It's not Powell personally against you. It's not real estate prices against you. It's not the brokers against you. You know, I mean, if you had a stop loss or you were protecting your downside on GameStop and you were using Robinhood, you still would have been fine. That sucks to hear that. I get it. It sucks. But there are sort of like general rules to being a good investor and trader. And, you know, when you're in speculative positions, you should probably be thinking about the downside protection. Otherwise, you risk losing all your money. 